The message I'm going to share with you as we get later on into it, I will share some personal things with you that I think are very interesting to say the least. But I've titled this Shutting the Door on Satan's Ability to Get into Your Life. Shutting the Door on Satan's Ability to Get in Your Life. One of the scriptures that reveals the attitude of the enemy, Satan, the devil, Lucifer, three different names that are often used in scripture. But the, the revelation of what he, how he thought in the beginning is Isaiah chapter 14, verses 13 through 15. And here's what the Bible says. For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the height of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet God says this to him, you should be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Did you know, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. And God, he said five times, I will. And one time God said, no, you won't. <laughs> All God had to do was say one time, no, you won't. And he was expelled. And Jesus said in recording Luke's gospel, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now, I want to say something to you, and I'm just going to get right to the main point right here. Is there anything that you and I can do that can help stop Satan's temptations when they come against us or stop the attacks that he is planning from taking place? Now, if I were to ask the average Christian, what weapons or what tools do we have to stop the attacks of the enemy? There would be four things that this crowd would present, and I would guarantee you almost everybody would get one of these four. First of all, we know that the Bible is a hindrance to satanic influence, power, temptation, and whatever Satan brings. We know from Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4 at the temptation of Jesus that he quoted three scriptures from the book of Deuteronomy against the three different levels of temptation Satan leveled at him. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. All three of those are involved in what Satan tempted uh, Jesus to do. However, what's interesting is when Jesus throws the scriptures at him, guess what the enemy does? He quotes a verse back. It's from the Septuagint version of the Bible. It's Psalms 91. He will give his angels charge over thee, and in their way, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. Now the Septuagint adds the phrase, lest at any time. The Septuagint is the Old Testament translated into the Greek. It's not in the original Hebrew text of Psalms 91, lest at any time. So Satan used a translation that was known in Jesus' day that was used in the Jewish synagogues, and he quotes that, and that's how we know it, he, Satan was actually quoting a version of the scripture that was available in the time of Christ in the synagogues. But listen to this carefully. You have to understand that even though we can quote the word, he knows the Bible. He knows his doom. And so this is why false prophets will use scripture to pull people in. This is why Paul said, be careful of angels of light that bring a word that's not a real word. So in other words, we have to understand that Satan uses the Bible. Therefore, he's not really afraid of a scripture. But Hebrews 4 and 12 says, when it comes out of your mouth, it's like a sword. And that's why he had to leave Jesus because the power of the word drove him out for a season. But, but just the word itself, he's familiar with that. Let me, let me say something else. There would be, if it was a total Pentecostal charismatic group, and I would say, give me something that defeats the enemy, most people would say, the anointing. And they would quote Isaiah 10, 27, for the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. There's a lot of definitions of the anointing. It's translated as the word unction. It is the absolute life of God operating in a human being in the form of God's power. That's what the anointing is. And the anointing touches you to preach with power. The anointing, as the Bible says, breaks yoke. The Bible said God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good healing all that were pressed to the devil. So the anointing can manifest healing. Satan, however, if you read Ezekiel 28 and verse 14, is called the anointed cherub. Wow. He's the only angel mentioned in all 66 books of the Bible where the word anointed is connected to him. So there was an anointing that was on him to lead the worship of heaven. So let me just say this. Satan understands the anointing. And what I want to tell you something about the anointing, just the anointing itself. 
I heard a minister, and you've heard me say this from the pulpit before, and he happens to be a friend of mine. I really love him. We're very dear friends. But he was in a great meeting one time, and he says, there's so much of God here, I feel the anointing, Satan can't touch me. And I cringed when he said that because I knew that Jesus was anointed at the Jordan River by the Holy Spirit in Matthew chapter 3, led by the will, in the wilderness, and he was tempted of the devil for 40 days. So I knew that, and do you know, literal, if I can use the expression, hell broke loose again that guy for months after he publicly made that statement. So what I want to say to you is the anointing breaks yokes, brings deliverance and can bring healing, but it does not exempt you from becoming sick. It does not exempt you from having a trial. Can I tell you something else? It don't exempt you from being tempted. So let's go on. Oh, listen, we're going to get to, we're going to get to some heavy stuff today. So you better stay with me through this whole thing today. All right. Number three, there are people that say, okay, if we rebuke Satan, the Bible says, if we resist the devil, he'll flee from us. But I also know that Jesus, the Bible says in Matthew chapter eight and verse 26, he rebuked a storm in Matthew 17 verse 18, he rebuked demons his mother-in-law was sick with the fever, so instead of, or Peter's mother-in-law was sick with the fever, I should say, and instead of Peter saying, let her die, Jesus, that's a mother-in-law joke. Uh, but he didn't do that. He said, I want you to pray for her. So in Luke chapter 4, 39, he rebuked a fever, a sickness that was so a fever, and she was healed. Now, the word rebuke, I've heard Greek scholars talk about the Greek word rebuke. Now, we think this is what it, it means. I rebuke you to use the word rebuke in a phrase of rebuking. But the Greek scholars will tell you that when you use the Greek word rebuke, it means to say a whole phrase of negative things toward. Okay, so in other words, when Jesus said, you foul spirit, it was not a foul spirit. He is absolutely mocking that spirit and telling it how stupid and vile it is. When Jesus said, you unclean spirit, you come out of the man. It was not an unclean spirit, but he in rebuking him called it a stupid, unclean spirit. When Jesus rebuked the wind, he said, peace be still. So when you say the word rebuke, it doesn't just mean to use the word rebuke in a phrase of Satan, I rebuke you. It means Satan, I'm telling you, I am sick and tired of what you're doing in my house and in my family. And I have authority over you through the power of the blood in the name of Jesus. And I resist you. And I'm telling you, you get your hands off my family. You get them off my life. I'm sick of this. I'm tired of this. I'm not putting up with it anymore. That's a rebuke. Okay, you don't rail on him, but you have the authority to rebuke him. But, you know, there are times, however, that the disciples would rebuke a spirit in a little boy and the spirit didn't come out. Right. You know, the story in, in Mark, Mark, uh, the Gospels there. Why? Because of their unbelief. And so Jesus told them this kind and that can mean this level of spirit, this the stronger spirit uh, uh, was not going to come out. You know, can I tell you a story in Mark, chapter five, Jesus met the man of Gadara that had all these demons in him. How many know that story? Two thousand pigs drowned. Some suggest that the word legion, when the demon in the man said to Jesus, I am legion for we're many, that there may have been up to fifty eight hundred to six thousand thousand demons in one man because that was what a Roman legion actually was. But when Jesus said, come out of the man, I heard a Greek scholar say this. If you look at it, he rebuked it and it didn't come out. And then he finally said, give me your name. And he says, my name is Legion for men. He said in the Greek, that story reads that Jesus is rebuking and then he's continuing to rebuke. And finally, he gets the name of the spirits because in Judaism, once you have the name of the spirit, you would call the name of it and it would exercise a different higher level of authority over it. That's why Jesus did that. And so we know that there are stronger demonic powers. So my point is, have you ever, listen to me now, we're going to take a survey. Have any of you ever rebuked the devil and he didn't buke? I have. I'm saying I rebuke, I rebuke, I rebuke, and it continues and it lingers. Let's be honest. Put your hands up. Wave it this way if you felt like you've ever rebuked. And here it just, I'm just like, what in the world is going on here? So here's the thing I want to tell you. All of these are spiritual weapons. All of these will work. 
But at the same time, I have rebuked Satan and it seemed like, am I doing something wrong? Because nothing's happening. I have been anointed by the Holy Spirit and dealt with him. But I also understand he knows the anointing and I've been anointed in my life and still got sick. I've been anointed in my life and still had issues. Are you, are you tracking with me, somebody? So this is what I want to say. What is the real key? Oh, Jesus. What's the real key to evicting the enemy? Well, most people would say this. If we use our faith properly, then our faith is what overcomes the enemy. And that absolutely a true statement. But I want you to think about James chapter 2 and 19. You believe there is one God, you do well. The devils also believe and tremble. The devils have faith that God exists because they know he exists. But the devils do not have saving faith. They have no access to the blood of Jesus. So they cannot be saved. It's not a salvation thing, but they believe. Can you, can you, let me say something. Have you seen the number of times in the Bible when people would say to Jesus, you're the son of God and a demon would say, thou art the son of God. Have y'all noticed how many times demons, people, Simon, Peter, people that were healed said he's the son of God. Do you know you've got people in the world who have a knowledge of the Bible that do not believe that Jesus is the son of God. And can I tell you what that means? That that means demons have more faith in God than some people do. Because at least they recognized him as the son of God. But again, it's not saving faith. It is not delivering faith. It is a belief that they know. It is a belief system. But see, here's the thing about your faith. Your faith can get weak to where you fall into something called unbelief. Now, I want you to listen to two things I'm going to tell you. It is an absolute fact when you read the Bible that God cannot answer an unbelief prayer. If you pray, you have to pray believing. You have to pray believing that it happens before it happens. You have to pray. There's rules of prayer. And if you pray in unbelief, why could not we cast the devil out, Jesus said, because of your unbelief. So un, un, two things. An unbelief prayer can never be answered. And any rebuking the enemy with unbelief, he doesn't have to respond. Can I prove to you that demons know whether or not you have faith? The demons in that little boy that was having seizures, when they tried to cast the devil out, they had unbelief and the demon sensed it and didn't have to come out. The spirit world, whether it's angels or demons, knows in the atmosphere of your spirit, they can read it whether or not you really believe or you don't. And, and I'm about to get to the main point, one of the main points that takes us to where we're going today. But listen to this. In Oral Roberts meeting years ago, there was a woman that had a cancer in her face. There was a man sitting next to her. Brother Roberts would come to the point in the service where he would say, touch the chair in front of you and put your hand, if you can, on where you're hurting or where you have the disease. This one put her hand on a cancer that was already into her, toward her jaw. It was awful. And she just did it like this and barely touched her skin. When Or Roberts prayed, she put her hand down and the whole cancer root and all had come out in her hand. Now, this is the weirdest story I ever heard in my life. She looked at her friend. I said, oh, my God, look. And she called the friend's name and the guy said, wow, that's a real miracle. So he's thinking, man, I'm going to grab, holler at Brother Roberts and scream and tell. And she, she did. She, instead of throwing it down, she says, that didn't happen. That can't happen. I can't believe that. And she, she somehow she did like this and it went and right back in. Just like it was. And here's what she said. And I've preached a message on this because one of Brother Robert's organ players from 1948 told me stories that he saw in the tent. And she said this statement, what my faith took off, my unbelief put back on. That's a tweetable moment right there. What my faith took off, my unbelief put back on. So in other words, we have weapons. They are effective. But there's got to be something, and I meditated on this, I said, God, there's got to be something that if we follow this and we can do this, that really hinders Satan's power, whether it's temptation or whether it's different trials. And so I want to give you a scripture. In fact, uh, I think there's three different translations I use here. And this is a statement of Jesus. He's going into the garden. His disciples uh, are, are unaware of everything that's going to happen. Jesus knows. And this is what Jesus says, John 14, 30. King James translation, hereafter, 
I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. John 14, 30, here's, a, here's a, um, another translation. I like this one. I will not speak with you much longer, for the prince of this world, that is Satan. Now, the prince of the world is Satan. The prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me. Then I went to the Amplified, and it says this. I will not talk with you much more, for the prince, evil genius ruler of the world, is coming. He has no claim on me. He has nothing in common with me. There is nothing in, mm, there's nothing in me that belongs to him. <laughs> he has no power over me. Are you listening, somebody? All right. Listen, listen to the statement that I'm going to make. The disciples were going to see him arrested. He could have got out of that by sending 12 legions of angels, right? They're going to, he's going to be beaten, because, but the Bible says by his stripes were healed. All this was the plan. He's going to spend the night in a dungeon. They show you that in Israel when you go on a tour in uh, Caiaph uh, the house of Caiaphas, the basement. Then he's going to be publicly humiliated and he's going to be crucified. All of this is going to happen. So it would be easy for the disciples to say, boy, Satan finally got to him, didn't he? But the Bible said, none of the princes of the world knew the plan. For had they had known the plan, they'd have never crucified the Lord of glory. Satan, God of the world, did not know that the shedding of Christ's blood would bring healing and salvation. And if he'd have known it, that that was God's secret plan, guess what he would have done? He'd have made sure nobody arrested him. He'd have told those guys in the garden, get out of the garden, and he'd have let Christ continue just to see what would have happened. Everybody tracking with me, say amen. amen. But here's the point. Now, you've got to get the point. The Bible says that he, speaking of Christ, knew no sin, but became sin to make us the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus was tempted in all points as you and I, come on, what's the rest of it? Yet without sin. So in his entire life, let's say of approximately 34 years, he was tempted of the enemy, but he never yielded to any temptation. They wanted to make him king, he ran from that. How many know what I'm saying? He ran from turning, turning the stones into bread. He, he not, not ran, but he quoted the verse against it. He, he, he ran away from the idea of jumping off the pinnacle of the temple. Satan was trying to get him to commit suicide. If God loves you, he'll protect you. That, that thing was hundreds of feet high. It would have killed him. So the point is that he did not know sin. Now, this is the key I want to show you. Because Jesus was able to avoid sinning in his life, it restrained the enemy from the attacks he was trying to send against him, and he literally escaped from every temptation and every attack because he made himself avoid sinning. And I want to say this. God says to Cain, if you do well, great, but if not, sin lieth at the door. What gets people's let me say it this way. What gets Satan's attention in the life of a believer? When I say Satan, I'm talking about the kingdom of darkness in general. It's when you start walking in your flesh. Because when you react and walk in your flesh, you, you, you cannot perform the law of the spirit. The law of the spirit of life is what sets you free from the law of sin and death. So Jesus, now let me, let me, let me, let me talk about the old timers for a minute, because I'm going to get to some stories here in a moment that are interesting. I want you to hear me when I share them. I'm going to really slow this down that I properly say everything the Lord would have me to say and not go beyond that. But I watched my dad. My dad was a uh, very I'm going to use the term holy man. I have watched Aunt B. My Aunt B, most of you know, was over the Daughters of Rachel, started praying for me in 1981, built a, a team of prayer women, 1,500 people. And by the way, a lot of them have gone to be with the Lord. Aunt B is 92 years of age. I'm going to hopefully see her in the next two weeks. She, she, she has, uh, from what I understand, a little bit of uh, 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 lung cancer, but she is one of them. She was the most godly woman. You could not touch her life. You could never touch anything in a conversation. Her, the 
the way she dressed, the way she acted. She was the epitome of somebody you read about in the New Testament, just a godly, you know, the Proverbs 31 woman. I mean, if, if, you, were, if you were to say there is a woman that is spiritually walked with God, would not gossip about anybody, prayed all the time, prayed in the Holy Spirit. And I think that's why she lived to be 92 or she's still about 92, I think 92 years of age. And let me explain something to you. The Bible says that the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will quicken your mortal body. We use that verse talking about the resurrection from the dead. That is not what it's talking about. It has no context with the resurrection. The Holy Spirit in you makes your body quicken. It, may, it renews your body. Though the outward man perishes, the inward man is renewed. B. Ogle prayed so much in, in her understanding and prayed so much in the spirit. Do you know what happened to her? The, the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead that dwelt in her, she prayed so much it kept her body renewed, body renewed. I never hardly knew her to get sick and now she's up in her 90s. So if you want to live long, get full of the Holy Spirit. Did you get, did you get what I just told you? All right. And I want to say something. Men like her, men like Dr. Lowry, men like my dad, and I could name many people, and you knew them growing up. You knew the granny in the church that every time, that she was the barometer. You knew the Spirit of God was coming because granny get to shimmying. Right? And I want to say to you, it was their stand. They, they wouldn't sin. They wouldn't give in. And because of that, the power of God stayed on them so heavy that when they prayed, miracles always happened. Put your hands together. Ha <laughs> ha. Experience a personal spiritual breakthrough, fresh knowledge, and a new understanding. Tap into God's wisdom while in your home, office, or driving by listening to the eight new messages from the 2023 International Main Event. Perry Stone's five new messages include three major prophetic updates that answer questions that many are asking. The titles are A Stern Warning to All Rapture Scoffers, Correcting Errors Being Taught Concerning the Great Tribulation, The Prophetic Missing Link of the Sign of Christ's Return, Included are two of Perry's most important warfare messages of 2023, shutting the door on Satan's ability to get into your life, the mystery that Satan tries to keep you from discovering. Along with Perry's five messages, when you order, you will hear Ron Carpenter unlock an amazing biblical mystery that will change your prayer life in his message. It's an inside job. Jensen Franklin shifted the atmosphere by exposing America's anemic Western Christianity in his message, I am not a professional Christian. John Kilpatrick received a visitation from the Lord, then presented an anointed spiritual manifesto entitled, First the Attack, Then the Blessing. These eight messages will help set an unshakable path for your spiritual walk and your expectations of a victorious outcome and prepare you prophetically for the future. You too can experience what thousands of others did when you order. The main event conference is available on audio CD, DVD, and audio USB drive. Also for your convenience, the conference is available as video on demand at perrystone.tv. The eight audio CDs are offer number 23ME-CD and are available for a donation of $55. The eight DVDs are offer number 23ME-DVD and are available for a donation of $95. The eight messages on a USB drive are available for a donation of only $55. Request offer number 23ME-USB. Order today by calling 1-888-21-BREAD. That's 1-888-212-7323. Or order online at perrystone.org. You may also mail a check to Perry Stone, P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37320. Order these messages today and uplift your spiritual life and help manifest with Perry Stone continue to reach the world. You know, at our main event, um, and by the way, thank you for joining me. Stay with me for just a few moments. At our main event at the Fall Festival, I can't tell you how many number of people came up to me and said, this message that you just heard, when I got into all of it and explained some things that have happened recently and things of that nature, helped me more than any message at the main event. And I'm, some of them were just in tears talking about it. And I hope you'll be able to get the DVD, CDs, or audio to listen to the entire message. And as we said earlier, we only can put an excerpt up because we only have 28 
uh, minutes and 30 seconds for, the mo for most of the television telecasts that we do. Now I do like to come into the studio and teach because I can time it to finish my message, but you can't do that in these live places because I preach about 70 minutes or more uh, in these events. And so if your program is only 22, 28 minutes, you can plainly see, you get basically the first part, and I've always said the main part comes later. So that's why it's significant to order the material. And let me say this, it's not just getting the message, but you help keep manifest on across the world. You know, our airtime is probably five and a half to six million dollars a year. Most of you know, we do not send out any letters in a year's time asking for help or finances or an offering. Uh, we take, we allow people to give, I say allow, we encourage people to give offerings during the three fall festivals of Israel. But outside of that, you're never bugged by us. We never, you know, are, are you know, robo calling you and asking you to do something. We just don't do that. We've never done that. And so if you would like to be a partner of our ministry, we have a partner, a special partner's Facebook page. Only partners can get to a partner's website. We've got uh, partner updates that only go to partners every month. So we have a lot of different things for partners of the ministry. Pam and I also do webcasts that only come to the partners. They don't go out anywhere else. So uh, you may want to be, do that. Just call the office and ask for the partner's director, and she'll be glad to talk to you and contact you on that. Now, we haven't set our full itinerary yet for, uh, for February, March, and April, but we can tell you as of right now to get prepared for the main uh, International Prophetic Summit, which will take place um, April 25th to the 28th. It goes Thursday night, opening up with Jonathan Kahn. Then we go all the way through Sunday morning with a double header. It's always, I always preach twice on Sunday morning, but someone else preaches with me most of the time. And then our Warrior Fest. Now, we have not had Warrior Fest because of COVID and sickness and so much going on, but we're bringing back the Warrior Fest. If you don't know what that is, let's show some pictures. This is our big yearly youth event. Now, we're only planning one in 2024. Sometimes we plan two in the spring, one in the summer. We're not doing that this year. We're only planning one. And you youth groups, the youth groups, that's you parents watching, your churches watching that have brought your youth group, please get registered to this when the registration comes give us a true registration and some people have 40 young people so they register 40 and they bring 20 young people see well that means 20 young people that could have come from another group weren't able to come because of that you know it's not a true registration so please look into this we are having so many people bring that advertisement up on the screen these are all the people come my daughter's there nick walker's there we've got chris estrada there we've got oh my goodness the bands that are coming uh, Catherine Mullins, Eddie, Eddie James, I mean, uh, uh, on and on it goes. And so this is going to be a just a, a powerful Friday night, all day Saturday, Sunday morning event, April the 5th through the 7th. So get ready for that when registration opens. And we send emails out and we want to make sure that the emails we send out from whether OCI or Voice of Evangelism, that they are getting to your box. So <clears throat> always remember to keep, keep our address down so that when you get it, it will come through your regular email addresses, okay? See you next week. My time is up. God bless you.